The sun rose. He looked out over the sweeping landscape ahead of him, and as the red tints of the sun turned to orange, then to yellow, a new seed of hope was planted in his soul. And as the sun rose further, that seed bloomed for all to see, recognize, and share. He did not hide his dream. It was as real to him as it was to everyone. But one day he stopped. The hope and the dream were still there, but the strength wasn't. The sun rose, but there was no one to look over the sweeping landscape ahead of them. And as the red tints of the sun turned to orange, then to yellow, a new seed of hope was planted in Canada. Hello. I didn't see you there. My name is Ian, and today we're talking about Stephen Zeitlin's Oh, Did You See the Ashes Come Thickly Falling Down? September 11th Street Poems. When we talk about folk literature, we almost by definition, almost by definition, default to oral literature. That this is stuff, verbal art, that is expressly meant to be understood as happening primarily in face-to-face -face communication, that they're spoken. But uh, folk literature and oral literature are not coterminous. The folk write. That should be self-evident, but sometimes it is not. Now, when the folk write, First of all, we want to always go back to our default position where the folk are always contemporary to their time and they use whatever is at their, uh, whatever is to hand, whatever they have available to them in order to communicate as they see appropriate. Um, it is not that they are incapable of reflexivity, just that like most of us, most of the time, they are not being reflective. If you were to ask them to do something traditional or folky or whatever adjective that you wish to use, they will probably limit themselves in genre. Or if it's music, they'll probably limit themselves in instrument or topic. But if they are merely expressing themselves uh, in the way that we tend to express ourselves for purposes of communicating to the people who are immediately present to us in a manner that is uh, understood to be important and understood to be relevant and understood to be aesthetically pleasing to the people who are immediately in front of us, then they will just use whatever they have to hand. We will just use whatever we have to hand. It's always so strange talking about the folk in the third person, but sometimes you just need to in order to hammer down the, the idea more clearly. So sometimes there comes a point when it is important to write something. To write something because you have, you understand that that is an appropriate response. It is still an immediate response. It is still has that idea of a certain amount of ephemerality. Uh, with perhaps recognizing that by doing certain forms that clearly announce themselves as having been thought out and, and announcing themselves as having been something more than merely spontaneous, although spontaneity is not a, a negative, um, something that, is, that announces its elaboration and something which commits itself to a medium like text or commits itself is especially created for particular occasions where even if the occasion is um, ephemeral it is uh, it is important that the words are crafted in a particular way the poem i just read by andrea Coziel was uh, written specifically at a Canadian Cancer Society meeting in January of 1984. So whether it was commissioned or whether it was something that she just asked if she could do, um, there was a deliberateness to it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there was going to be a life beyond that. 
folk poetry is using the conventions and the expectations and the understanding of uh, poetic form, sometimes in the form of parody, no less, taking specific poems and replacing words and replacing uh, aspects to the, uh, re replacing key signifiers. And parody, not necessarily in terms of, of, of comic parody, but parody in terms of replicating uh, a verse form or replicating a form, and in this case, a verse form, that implies that the reader would be aware of the original model and is making connections between this one and the original model, and not necessarily ironic juxtapositions that like sort of more comic parody might suggest. And what is more, um, the occasions and the places for it. So uh, often, if you have a community newspaper, um, and it doesn't need to be a very small community newspaper, the Cape Breton Post will have them on occasion in the form of letters to the editor, people will feel impelled to write pieces of verse. And uh, we have so much in the archives of verse that was submitted to newspapers uh, as a way of commenting on the moments of the day, commenting on something, either a person or an event, and it doesn't always need to be elegiac, it can be celebratory as well, but verse becomes something that is an appropriate folk response. I'm using the word appropriate because Pauline Greenhill has a sort of a double play on the concept of appropriate. In, 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 one, in one case, um, it is a vernacular understanding of when occasions call for verse. And um, in another way, it's more like the, uh, not so much appropriate, but appropriate in terms of uh, taking these models and building on them. Because one of the things that distinguishes folk poetry from, say, the poetry of the, uh, the professional poet, uh, as it were, is that the professional poet is much more concerned with novelty. In the reading, he's describing the a project that his group City Lore did, where they created or commissioned, as it were, two uh, poems, each 110 lines long, to represent the 110 stories of each of the towers, uh, the Twin Towers in, in uh, New York City, of the World Trade Center. Um, I'm just assuming Sorry, I'm just assuming that the audience remembers or at least is, is historically aware of the events of 9-11, but planes hit the towers, uh, uh, planes hit uh, the Pentagon, and another plane was going to go somewhere and was uh, uh, wrestled to the ground by passengers all on the mor uh, morning of Tuesday, September 11th, 2001. Um, but I'm forgetting that that's now 19, over 19 years ago now. Um, so uh, he commissions these, uh, they commissioned these two poems, and one was comprised of lines taken uh, and commissioned from poets, named poets, poets who have uh, an extant reputation, like Adrian Rich, and, uh, po and the other one taken from uh, uh, street poetry, lines that are, that are expressed. And both are moving documents in their own way, but uh, he points out the, um, the well-known poets whose work appeared in Tower 2 sought to move outside the well-worn ideas of the street poems. A number of them were concerned with words themselves. So they were trying for new metaphors, new expressions, and sometimes they were talking about the paucity of their words to express things. But they were always looking for a new metaphor because, you know, speaking poetically, it is about uh, the, the aesthetics of the image uh, that uh, is, is sought. Uh, yes, the poets searched for images both accessible and obscure. The poetry of the streets had a different kind of work to do. It addressed the ruptures in time-tested ways and sought to make the horrific bearable. The dead are still with us. The towers can be recreated in our hearts. We are all one family in the wake of tragedy. 
uh, kill the bastards, as one, one quote says. The people's poetry of September 11th engaged the city in a rhetoric that affirmed and reaffirmed these simple ideas. The dead address the living, the living address the fallen towers. As in much folk poetry, emphasizing the sentiments through repetition seemed more important than expressing original ideas in an original way. So folk poetry could be, and has on occasion, been uh, derided because it is not original in the same way that we look for originality in the words of capital P poets. But they're different vehicles of expression, despite the fact that they, that, uh, they are both operating within the same form. So, as you read this, Zeitlin is an interesting guy. Uh, in addition to being one of the most important public folklorists in the United States, by by having, I think he started, and if he wasn't the, the if he wasn't the initiator of it, he was certainly the standard bearer for decades of city lore, which basically was the public folklore arm uh, uh, organization for documenting. Um, New York City, and he, he has a number of books that talk about these, you know, expressive performances, and New York as a, as a community of communities, and New York as having its own sort of overriding ethos that is, is um, where, where the one homogenizing factor is heterogeneity and, um, and being in place. Um, as you read it, one of the first things you might grasp is how well written it is, that it is a lovely thing to read, that even though it is an academic piece and he's quoting Eliade and he's quoting uh, Foucault, he does quote Foucault if I recall, he's quoting all these different um, uh, you know, sources, intellects, in intellectual history and so on, he's, he gives the reading sort of academic gravitas, but it is nevertheless pleasurable to read. And in part because the other aspect of Zeitlin is he is a great, I'm using the word standard bearer again, for one of the key aspects of the study of folklore that should be an embedded practice um, in, in that we go through the world uh, and it is a delightful, we, everyone, not we folklorists, but we go through the world and it is a delightful thing to aestheticize the world, to aestheticize our pleasures, our pleasurable conversations, to aestheticize our forms, to aestheticize our play, and that it is nice to live in a world that is constructed a little bit also on the basis of what we find beautiful and what we find pleasing. So the book that this is from, The Poetry of Everyday Life, Storytelling and the Art of Awareness, uh, he has chapters about the, sort of the beauty of games and the beauty of um, uh, actually the, the, the aesthetics of sex, no less. So, you know, everything can be um, a, a delightful practice. It reminds me of Oscar Wilde has two quotes about wallpaper. One is very famous because it's meant to be his last words and it's reported ambiguously or reported differently, but basically uh, I think at its most extended it goes along the lines of, and I am doing this from memory, um, this wallpaper and I are having, uh, are having a battle and uh, one of us has to go. Uh, sometimes it's rephrased as uh, either the wallpaper goes or I have to. And those are his dying words. And he has another one, and uh, I, I wasn't able to track it down, but I believe it was when he was on his tour of America, and it, ha it, was, it was during an interview he was giving in Denver, I think. So whenever he toured America, eight, the eight, late 1880s, early 1890s, prior to Battle of Reading Jail and prior to his uh, uh, imprisonment and so on, clearly. Uh, when he was the leading uh, uh, celebrity, and someone was was saying, um, asking him what was the worst thing about America, words along those lines, and he said, "Your ugly wallpaper." And to me, that's always been a sort of a mission statement of of sorts that there is something about a world that has forgotten that beauty is good in and of itself and the aesthetics of life is a good in and of itself um, and 
that it is both, I mean, he's being witty because he's Oscar Wilde and he practically invented wit. But more than anything, I think he's expressing a profound truth that what do we have? What is the value if, uh, of things if we do not contemplate the beauty of things as well? And why we would subject ourselves to utilitarianism when we have the possibility and a reasonably accessible possibility of making things wondrous and making things delightful. So after the attacks of September 11th, within hours, people were expressing themselves through words, uh, through small statements, sometimes as simple as just saying bastards, exclamation point, or sometimes just because that's what one does. One marks things, one renders them into words, and, and certainly communicating a message to people who are not immediately present, despite the fact that ephemerality might be in place. And uh, what is more ephemeral as a writing surface than uh, uh, dust on a, uh, on a windshield, particularly the dust that is coming off of the towers as they are still in the process of, of collapse? Um, or the, the, the dust cloud has, has yet to fully settle and it, what's written on the windshield will be erased not by, wa not by rainwater, but by more dust lying upon it. And then the people who, by 3 p.m., had brought uh, you know, butcher paper down and were posting it up and brought pens and were asking people to start writing messages, not necessarily in the form of poems, but in the form of messages. And then those messages often got rendered into snippets of verse, either verse that was read into it, and that that statement, that little pithy um, uh, expression, looks like poetry, or clearly more deliberative moments where people were writing something in an expressive form. Um, and then the other aspect had to do with... Um, Again, it's this lovely micro study of uh, of the events of those uh, the, the days afterwards and, and the, the vernacular response, and that one of the next things that happened were people putting up missing signs. You know, have you seen? Well, this is what they were wearing, and so on. And the way that the photocopy centers gave um, you know free 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 copies to people who needed to put up posters, and posters went up everywhere, and it was quickly recognize that there was not going to be, these posters were not going to be uh, successful in terms of making reconnections for the most part. And then as Amy Waldman said in the New York Times, manufactured in hope the flyers have now transmuted into memorial. So all of a sudden many of the streets in the immediate neighborhood and then of course around around the world because we'll Spontaneous shrines will emerge, not simply at the sites, although the sites are some of the most important, but at other places of communal grief. Um, the, the landscape becomes transformed. They become places where messages get, get left, where messages, whether of the, the lit candle, whether of the, the teddy bear, whether of flowers, of course, and then whether pieces, scraps of verse, messages that are sent, and that there is an ongoing aestheticization, that this is what people do when they are in the, they are in the throes of wishing to communicate, communicate to those who cannot clearly hear, but, you know, now we're talking about the, the ritualistic aspect of whether you want to call it an axis mundi, but at particular sacred places. And these places are rendered sacred because collectively we have given them that power by reformulating the landscape in, into a shrine, even if that shrine is composed of nothing more than posters and, and candles and teddy bears. Uh, we've momentarily shaped the landscape into a sacred place, and then through that sacred place we can access another world, another the, the world of the dead, or at least the world of the non-living. And so that is where we go and that is where we message and that's even where we will project their messages back onto us. And so those poetries that came back 
uh, and uh, and the way that it was un- that this reformulation of the landscape and therefore this opportunity to express in poetry was done by uh, a very implicit consensus that um, you know doubly so within a crowded contemporary metropolitan city like New York um, uh, where all space is claimed um, the reappropriation of space is a very difficult thing to do and yet businesses the city uh, parks department they all more or less unanimously but without having to deliberate um, said yes that we will allow our spaces to be reappropriated so again it becomes this part of collective action so when we think about oral literature, when we think about folk literature, when we think about these vernacular aestheticizing practices, we tend to sometimes, and again the the we is slippery, sometimes we tend to hold them up in comparison to that category that we call art in Western culture, where art has a connotation of a certain amount of distinctiveness, a certain amount of genius, not necessarily in terms of IQ brilliance, but in terms of unique, I don't know why I put an H in there, in terms of unique inspiration that is um, uh, that cannot be reproduced. I mean, you you can clearly imitate, but imitation is is not an act of genius. Um, genius is a uh, its own thing, and I think there's a lot of not necessarily in um, not necessarily in contemporary philosophy of art discussions. Uh, is is the concept of genius brought up, but it is certainly recognized as one of the things that has created this understood category of art. The things that get hung in museums as opposed to the things that get hung in like folk art museums or the things that get hung in um, sort of, uh, you know, cultural museums. There's a difference between, you know, the gallery wall and and the the museum wall, the community art spaces versus art spaces. Um, I mean, and that, that's one of the that's one of the ongoing tensions that folklorists are, are often encountering. In that we see these works that are, um, uh, well, no, sorry, let me rephrase this. Um, we there is this tendency of because the idea of genius is so wrapped up in in how well really fundamentally how the academy views art and how high culture understands art and artistry that um it's difficult to sort of dislodge that that uh, that mentality and then then we are measuring folk art whether that is um folk literature, whether that is folk cooking, whether that is vernacular architecture, against the, the standards of uh, a uh, gatekeepers of, the, by the standards of the gatekeepers who are invested in the concept of genius. And we'll think of, th- in terms, of terms like formulaic inherently negatively um, and we'll think of things like the appropriation of forms as um, as a complex unless one does something radically different with them and so yes in fact there's there was I remember there was a review of Pauline's book true poetry uh, and it's like yeah well this isn't poetry and that was basically the entire review she spent an entire but it was written by a literary critic it was lit- written by someone who teaches poetry at a university and and it's almost as if the the reviewer pretty sure it was a he um, uh, yeah it was 
Um, it's almost if you didn't read the book in, in terms of, yes, this is the poetry that is written for these accounts. It is different from these things. And measuring it by these things is one of the reasons why it hasn't been examined and hasn't been given due credence. So I am aware that it is not poetry, but basically he was like, this isn't good poetry. And screw that guy. Uh, Zeitlin has this, as, uh, expresses it in this way, because it speaks about the immediacy of the form. And that what, despite the fact that people were using something that um, was not of the level of ephemerality as face-to-face -face communications, precisely because the people they were communicating with weren't present because they were dead. They, you cannot do face-to-face, -face, so you only have this medium of either the materiality of the candle or the text to be read of, of the, the written message. Although, of course, people would go and talk as well. In our culture, we think of art as culling elements from what passes for real life rearranging them and offering them as a commentary, metaphorical or lyrical, on our lives. In response to upset, uh, sorry. In response to September 11th, poems were written with the urgency of art, but put back into the flow of life to take their place anonymously alongside ritual objects that were part of the mourning process. Words were forged into poetry not for art's sake, but to pierce the barrier that separates the living from the dead. In this worldly city, along our secular sidewalks, stoops, and parks in all five boroughs, New Yorkers spoke to one another in a language of symbols and ritual acts, refusing to give death the last words. So, yeah. Now, those, because they were ephemeral, because they were part of a spontaneous shrine complex and spontaneous shrines almost by definition end. I mean, they, they can be photographed, the objects can be collected, they can be inventoried, but as sort of a, a, a living monument, they disappear over time. Eventually, the flowers are taken away. The teddy bears were taken away from Kensington Gates when Princess Diana died. All the spontaneous shrines that will sometimes emerge, that, that, that do emerge, uh, eventually they come to an end. Um, uh, and, you know, we, 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 we don't then immediately turn to artists, but often the, the capital A artists end up having the more permanent words because of power in the community. And so we'll think of uh, elegies like Springsteen's The Rising, which speaks with a similar vernacular to uh, as folk poetry and as folk song, um, but at the very least has the, um, uh, it has the weight of not being anonymous. It has the weight of being something from someone who we turn to, to express things. Uh, and it also comes from the inventory, from the, uh, not the inventory, comes from the um, industry of, uh, professional art and that is not in any way to decry Springsteen's The Rising it's just to suggest that um, the uh, the ephemerality of the folk uh, often can't linger much longer the folk poetry that people put in the newspapers only becomes accessible through well maybe someone clipped it out put it in a scrapbook put it on the side of the fridge um, engaged with it in particular ways. Maybe, maybe on occasion, newspapers or local historians collect and make an anthologies, but those would be rare and limited run. And they really only exist in microfilm and archives uh, because they weren't meant to exist much longer than that. They were deliberate creative acts. Um, they were meant to be shared to a certain extent, but shared in the same way that someone shares newspaper or someone shares a notice on a wall or someone shares even a piece of graffiti, knowing that eventually someone is more than likely able to erase it. So there you go. I recommend Zeitlin. I recommend thinking about, when we talk about folk literature, moving beyond 
orality. Thinking more in terms of immediacy, in terms of ephemerality, in terms of um, expediency. That sounds like a, a, a harsh negative, but it isn't. Because it is about expressing oneself and expressing an idea. Um, because Not because the way that one expresses it is meant to last, but because the idea needs to be expressed now to meet the expectations of the audience and to be fully understood as a communicative act that does what most communicative acts should do, fundamentally reaffirm the community between uh, the messenger and the receiver. Okay, my friends, I am done, as ever. I wish you nothing but the best. Be well.